to welcome to this very special program, The Way Forward, uh, the mu Art Museums and the Age of Crises. I'm Vishaka Desai, Chair of Committee on Global Thought, which is the organizing group at Columbia University for this program. And this program is part of a much larger multi-year research project called Politics of Visual Arts in a Global Context, organized by the Committee on Global Thought and this program that I also have the honor and the pleasure of directing with many of my colleagues. Um, this project, this particular project, long-term project, is supported by a major grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation on the Visual Arts. I am thrilled that all of you are here. We have, at least registration-wise, more than 21 countries represented. So I know that there will be lots of good points of discussion from many different parts of the world, and I hope you will be part of that. Uh, just a quick word, and that is that we intend this to be a real conversation among our panelists and with all of you. So please feel free to make your notes in the chat function, put it in the question mark, uh, question and answer section, and I will try to pay attention and bring your thoughts in as we are discussing different topics, but we will also have some time towards the end of the session in the last 15, 20 minutes to really deal with the questions that you have in mind. Let me just say that more than three years ago, which seems like a lifetime ago, when we started this project, the world, especially the art world, was already reeling from questions that range from decolonizing institutions or repatriation of objects and social justice to equity questions, to the questions of protests, again, museum governance, who has the right to own objects and who has the right to support museums. Can museums actually survive as above social changes or should they be completely part of where societies are, the questions of equity and questions of museum governance were already in the air. And then COVID happens. At the time of the pandemic, by the closure of the museums, this was another existential crisis, if you will, for museums. Audiences stopped. You could not figure out how to actually get the finances that would come from the admissions and to support the museum. At the same time, one could say that in that particular crisis, there was also the time for reflection. Where do we go from here? When we open our doors, how can we open our doors with all of the other issues that were swirling around? And I just want to remind you that it was in 2019 that Holland Quarter, a good friend and also one of the co-chief uh, art critic of the New York Times wrote, that in space of a barely one year, the very foundation of museums, the money that sustains them, the art that fills them, and the decision makers that run them have been called into question. And there is no end to this questioning in sight. That was in the summer of 2019. And then COVID happens. And here we are, as museums get ready to reopen their doors, as many of them have, there is still the questions that have, were there prior to the pandemic that we need, need to really come to terms with. And so the question for museum professionals, as well as some of us, and I include myself in it, formerly a museum person, now a museum watcher in an academic setting, along with my colleague uh, Arjun Apadurai, who is here, that the question comes up, is this an inflection point that will turn into transformation? Or is this an inflection point that like other inflection points will settle into business as usual. What will it take not to be business as usual? Some of these questions I want to ask our colleagues who are gonna join us for this program. And may I now invite uh, Arjun Apadurai and Pasternak and Matthew Teitelbaum along with Kamini Soni to join us 
for this um, conversation, and I will introduce them all together. And let's see if we can get everybody on. Just great. Um, and while we await them, let me just introduce them one at a time. Um, Dr. Arjun Apadurai, who is the Goddard Professor Emeritus in Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University. And more importantly, also, he's a distinguished visiting professor at Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Hal, Germany, where he resides now. Um, I think of Arjun as one of those anthropologists who has really given new meaning to the word globalization in a cultural context. And to really think seriously about the various life of objects in different contexts. So how do we think about that? And that is why, along with his deep connection now to Germany, why I wanted to make sure that uh, Professor Apadurai is with us and give us a kind of a perspective that is not from within, but also from without. Uh, Anne Pasternak, uh, who is a Shelby White and Leon Levy Director of the Brooklyn Museum. She has served in this position since 2015. And it's amazing for me to think that it was that long ago that you joined, because I still think of you as a newcomer uh, in the field of big museum, so-called encyclopedic museums that I have now taken to call museums of partial histories. Um, and for more than 30 years has been an active, active proponent of art and its power to connect, to motivate, to move, to inspire, and to interrogate. And that she did amazingly well at Creative Time, and now she continues to blaze that trail ahead at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, Kamini Soni, who is the director of the Museum of Arts and Photography in Bangalore, India, or Bangaluru, as we're supposed to call it now. Um, she's really the founding director of this museum. And one of the things that's so interesting about the work that MAP, as this museum is called, and what Kamini and her team are doing, is to really put the idea of museum on its head and especially what they're doing with audiences, what they're doing with objects and its relationship to people is something that needs to be heard in the context of the big major museums and large museums that we also think about when we think about these issues. And last but not the least is Matthew Teitelbaum, and he's the Anne and Graham Gunn Curator of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and he has served in this position also since 2015. And I just realized that I hadn't thought about it, but you know, I have connections to both of these museums because I've worked at both of these museums. And I came to be who I am because of the things I did and learned at both the Brooklyn Museum and at the MFA. And it is like a little familial, but I hadn't really thought about it. I thought of two of you as people and what you can bring to the table. Um, so for Matthew to run, again, like the Brooklyn Museum, a museum that's one of the oldest museums in the country, to really change, to create initiative, deal with new programs, invite audiences to participate in a way that is quite unusual is one of the reasons I was interested in having Matthew on the program. And at the same time, both of these museum directors are dealing with big challenges that are emblematic of our time. So welcome, all of you, um, to help us to reflect on where we've been, but more importantly, think about where we need to go and how we will get there. Um, so the very first question I want to ask all of you is very simple, and that is, tell us one thing that you feel has happened in this last few years that has made you rethink your position and your thinking about museums. And I want to start uh, with you, Anne. One thing that has made me rethink my position in the museum, I, I don't actually think that there was a 
major epiphany. You know, I feel like my whole life has been one of unlearning the things I was taught. And so it's a, it's a sort of stripping away of social conditioning. And certainly the past two years or past year has been a more rapid stripping away of things that I had been conditioned. Uh, but I don't think there was like a, a moment where I was like, aha, I, I know that's not true for all directors. I mean, I do have colleagues who didn't think structural racism, for example, was actually a thing and didn't understand what that is. Um, I've, I've known that for a long time. So um, I think that instead for me, it's been a, a personal and pro professional um, intensive period of questioning. Uh, you know, my thinking and my practice and recommitting myself to even more rapid change and uh, personal and professional growth. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that, and partly, as you said, that it was not something completely new. It's because of your work at Creative Time that there was so, and other things you have done even before, that you came from the setting that was not the same kind of institutional setting. And that seems a little different. And Matthew... It seems to me that therefore, you as a museum professional coming from Ontario, coming to the MFA, you've been like me, you breathe the life of art museums. So how about this past few years, especially during the time of COVID, what has changed for you that has made you feel that you have to really do something different? Well, the first thing to say is, Vishaka, you're clearly a lapsed museum director because anybody who says can you give one thing that's changed and think a museum director can stick to one thing um you know i i i want i want to live your life but i just want to <laughs> say there are a lot of things that i'm thinking about although i'm generally in agreement with them um <clears throat> so i was thinking about it in terms of experience and learning um it's certainly true the last two years have been extraordinary that is to say not like a museum director usually uh, uh, leads. And what I mean by that is the range of issues that come at us, the um, control, the sense of not being in control of those issues, and the uh, critical mass of issues that have come that, as Anne says, have been latent or even just under the surface that need to be reckoned with. And I think the confluence of them is extraordinary in this moment, whether it's <clears throat> racial inequity, morality issues around collecting wealth disparity. I mean, these are all things that we were touching on, thinking about, uh, I would say, to some degree, modestly addressing. I think the con con congruity of all of these issues now is leading us to be much more intentional on the change we want. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I know I was just going to say that I've, I've often called it the trifecta of from the audience to object to governance of institutions, all of them are coming together in a way that it makes it very difficult not to recognize that it is leading to something. I mean, that's what trifectas do in some ways, you know. So when I ask you about the one thing, you're very right. Maybe that one thing is the confluence, right? That all of them then jostle for your attention. And the but speed and the intensity, Matthew. Yeah. Right? Sorry, the intensity. The speed yes. and the intensity. Mm -hmm. But to answer the question that was embedded in your original question, I do think change is upon us. I don't think it'll be. I don't think it'll be um, truly revolutionary. I don't think our institutions can stand it. But I think there's no doubt in the last two years that the commitment and the necessity of incremental change is not negotiable. And, uh, you know, we can talk more about that, but, but, but that would lead me, as we will talk about some of the remarkably positive things that have happened in this moment. Absolutely. So Kamini, you are starting a museum and birthing a museum, as all of our other colleagues are talking about 150-year-old, 160-year-old institutions. And you've actually changed the parameters and the paradigm of museums. Tell us a little bit about reflection of the moment, both from the perspective of objects, but also just in terms of the social equity questions from the Indian perspective. Well, if I were to reflect on the last two years, I think what, what it, it did for us, the pandemic was to, was to literally turn things on its head. Because until then we were so entirely focused 
on the roadmap to the opening. But then the lockdown continued, the uncertainty grew, and we were in this unique position where we had really nothing to hold on to other than a plan, a plan for a museum and a building that was coming up. But you know, the the locked as I said, the lockdown continued. We were not sure what to do, and then we were having this this brainstorming with our advisors and our board, and it was a time of, of a lot of confusion. And and the message that we kept getting back was, why are you so fixated on a physical space? Why don't you think of digital space? And because that's the need of the time. And if you want to be relevant, if you want to stay connected, then that's what you need to do. And while some organizations felt this was a, a contemplative time for reflecting perhaps on what had gone before and what was the way forward for map, it was a time of frenetic, frenetic activity because there were no models to follow. No museums had gone before to do this. And so here we were looking for skills and for people who understood this, this whole new space. And we did not want to replicate the experience of a physical space. So we were looking at the tools of the digital platform to try and enhance the experience. Um, so looking at audio, looking at video, what are these tools that can help us create narratives around objects? Yeah, and so when a visitor logs onto the, onto the digital museum, what we're trying to provide is that music museum experience, you know, online exhibitions, learning facts that people can, kids and families can download from the comfort of their homes, a reading section with blogs and articles and essays, the collection online to browse through. So we had to get the collection online, a whole series of programs and events that you can sign up and watch for. But so it, it was really a time of a lot of activity. But if you ask me what stands out for me during this period, I think the need to be able to think differently, um, to be able to reimagine the way you can connect with your audience, and um, the need to be relevant to the changing needs of the community. Mm. So the change is upon us. You're just coming at it in a completely different way uh, to start from outside in, if you will. And Arjun, as, as a museum watcher, and as somebody who thinks about objects. And as you think about this moment, and especially as we talked earlier, I was very interested in being in Germany with the founding of the, and opening of the Humboldt Forum and where that is. Um, tell us a bit about, as you think of this particular point and inflection point, trifecta of, of issues that are coming up, as it's also felt in Europe in a big way. Uh, where do you come out as to what this moment feels like? Yeah, well, thank you. I'm very uh, much reacting and thinking about the things that have been already said uh, by my uh, colleagues and by you. So my mind is a bit uh, crowded, but still trying to address your question, uh, Having come to the United States at the age of 17 something in 1967, uh, I think I have some sense of that country <laughs> and the journeys from 1967 to what, 2016 when I came here to then. 2016. So, 2016, when I came here. Yeah, though you got back, back in time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's 50 years in the US, so I feel some connection <laughs> to various generations and histories there. But I want to say three things in a very uh, condensed, perhaps even uh, epigrammatic or aphoristic form and see if they have any purchase with the rest of us. One is every institution I know has now begun to behave like a different kind of institution. So the New York Times, the last or the 90th news, like our man Flint said, is to give us the news. It does 300 other things that newspapers never did. It runs educational programs, it does this. Look at universities. They do 75 things that universities did not earlier do. Although in the US, universities bloated their, their role to being hospitals, counseling centers, stadiums, et cetera, a long time ago. But still, they themselves are trying to be other than what universities classically were. Churches are becoming something else. Hospitals are becoming, 
So I urge us to think in an ecology where every fundamental institution, at least in the contemporary West, actually is doing the job of 20 other institutions. I won't even go into the army and navy of whom the last use is killing people, but they do lots of other things, uh, perhaps even more invidious, the first point. The second one is I think going to museums a little more closely and coming to your question, I throw this out there, that <clears throat> museums I think have the great challenge which even transcends the question of the digital, which is of course huge, but that is that they, whatever they are, whether they are churches or universities or labs, all of which they try to be at some point, they were about some form of representing, curating, communicating and disseminating the past. What does it mean to become something about the future? In other words, what does it mean to pivot into that? To me, that's a big question. And the way I think of that question very concretely is what does it mean to think of a world where everything is in motion, migrants, objects, this, that, and how can museums capture that motility or mobility? It's very, very hard to do, practically speaking, but it has to be thought about. And my sense is that this is a very uh, concrete uh, challenge. And my own personal research work, and I'll be so bold as to throw it in, in its slightly more high octane, because I have to you know, also compete with intellectuals from Chicago or Harvard, et cetera. It's a very tough business. So there, my feeling is museums need to begin to pay attention to what I call uh, symptoms uh, in the archive, symptoms of the future, that is, all the way back from the third millennium BC, there are objects which are actually symptomatic of things to come. How do you know which those are? Which don't tell you about that time or place in question, but which actually point us to the next one. That's, so that's my personal little thing, uh, but I do think it has some relevance to what museums could do in order not only, though that's very important, to be sites for literacy about what's past on the human record, but to be something more. I well, I think there. what what you're getting at is actually, it seems to me, is something we have to reckon with, which is the power of art. You know, I was very interested in what, or objects, uh, what Anne had said in her little brief introduction oh. thing for your bio, and that is the capacity of art to inspire, to imagine, to reflect, to heal, which is one of the words people use, and objects that manifest the specificity of issues that are part and parcel of our society. Art has that unique capacity to be of a time and place and to transcend that time and place, the symptoms of future, as you're talking about, but right there is the nub of the problem. So one problem is, can you transform the objectivity or object, the physicalness, mm -hmm. and therefore there is the virtual reality and where you can do. Mm -hmm. And that's what Kamini, what you have done. Um, then there is the issue of the real thing. And the real thing that embodies this multiplicity of meaning. How do we do that? And so I want to just briefly go to Kamini, the question of audiences. Your audiences are now everywhere, and yet you're trying to build a museum, and it's about the physicality of things. How are you thinking that you will change what will happen in the building because of your experience of the last two years? The question of an audience is a really difficult one because we're really talking about taking art into the heart of the community and creating a museum going culture which does not really exist in India. Because if you asked people, gave them a choice, whether they'd like to go to the mall or to the, uh, to the films or to a restaurant or, or to a museum, I can assure you nobody's breaking down the doors to enter the museum. So when we talk about taking art to the heart of the community, technically everybody 
should be our audience, whether it's children or college students or young professionals or families. But the pandemic really required us to expand our vision of what that audience could be. Because we thought of it in, in let me say, originally in three concentric circles. You know, first the community where the museum was located, and then you build that relationship, and then they develop a sense of ownership of the museum, and then they take it out to the rest of the country and then across the world. But we had to very quickly change that strategy because we went online and then that opened up new audiences and participants and really geography became history. The whole world was your oyster. You could potentially reach out to a whole range of people and participants who were available to from any part of the world. But while we look at audiences, when we go forward, I think there's something very powerful about a physical space. So that's very much part of the plan. And we hope to open this physical space um, in the second half of next year. But when we do that, we're also looking at how we can make this a very inclusive and accessible space for our audiences, because it's a new building. We have a lot of flexibility. Um, right from, we've been sitting with our architects and our advisors, for example, DIOC, which is the Diversity and Equal Opportunity Center. So how do we make a museum that's welcoming to everybody? And um, this also goes to our, our digital platforms as well, because um, we are looking at, even in that space, how do we, what are the fonts and the colors and the contrast that we use? We have alt text, our programming is in sign language. We have sign language interpretation. In our recent digital festival, we had a complete parallel channel with audio description. So we're looking at all sorts of things, but going forward, even when we open the physical museum next year, we feel that it will probably be a hybrid where the, the digital and the physical are, about, are both two parts of both. And each has its unique strengths that will help us engage with our audience. So right there, I think for both you, Anne and Matthew, with things that span the world that have been there for hundreds of years, at least as a museum person, I always used to say that I believe in the virtual, but not at the same level as the real connection to the real thing. But what is that connection? For whom? And how do you deal with that in this moment of, I, I almost feel that the one of the things about art is that art doesn't want to be boxed in. And yet what institutions do is to box it in, in a particular viewpoint, in a particular way of looking at it that may be more institutional. So there is that notion of the multiplicity embodied in the objects. And yet, in terms of the real encounter, online you can do that very well. How do you do that in the physical setting for the different audiences that you are trying to really get at? And Matthew, we'll start with you. Um, I'm thinking a lot about, about what has just been said, uh, thinking a lot about uh, the challenge to the notion of the physical museum, uh, believing deeply in the need for the physical museum. But there's not only the mobile content and the way in which that moves, there's now also 3D printing and NFTs and the way in which content, which is legitimate and real, okay, legitimate and real is also a threat to the notion of the physical museum. Um, I've always believed that the most important thing that a museum creates is audience. Uh, it has to care for objects. It has to care for its staff, goes without saying. But in terms of the effect uh, the meaning of the work we do, it is to create an audience that cares about what it is that we do. What I do think one of the learnings is, uh, in terms of sort of in the intensity of it, but back to Anne's point, so much of this was part of discussion earlier, but now with real intensity in a way I don't think we can go back, is the notion of uh, co-created content. Mm. And um, I do think that uh, if we are going to create audience and create our institutions as places of, of gathering, uh, then we must articulate how people gather with purpose. And uh, to me, one of the great things that's come out of this moment uh, is the way in which we have been reciprocal with each other in developing narrative. 
And I think that the learning from that is if we don't figure out how to bring that into our museums, then the other two threats, and there are more, of finding content satisfaction community elsewhere um, will overtake us. Uh, I do come back to the very complicated, and I know these aren't the um, correct words uh, to use today, but I'll use them anyway, that in the founding principles of the British Museum, the goal is to create the enlightened citizen. And I know both words are complicated. Um, but what I mean by that is to give the communities we serve a sense of belonging in our space. And I think that um, uh, I'll stop by just saying what I've what I believe and what my what my work has been focused on is to create diverse inputs <clears throat> to create many entry points to vary to the narrative we share. And I think if museums don't get that right we will be less and less uh, effective and meaningful for our communities. So co-creation does also get at the very heart of the so-called expertise of curators. And what do you do about that? And I think that Arjun, uh, when it comes to, you've talked about the university as well, and what at Columbia, uh, what Lee Bollinger calls that university has to have the fourth purpose which is not just research, pedagogy, and service, but actually purpose of making a difference through your knowledge in the community, for the community, it's a fourth purpose. So it does get to the question of how do you co-create a content, especially when you have had people who have spent years, if not decades, learning about something. So how do you deal with that? And this is both for Arjun, you and also for Anne, because Anne, from the perspective of really right there, Egyptology, you know, you've had colleagues. I used to know Richard Fazzini, who was a really, really good friend of mine when I was a young 22 year old at Brooklyn Museum. People who have done amazing work, and I was just thrilled about learning about that because I didn't know anything about that. But there is a question of co-creation and parity. Parity, that really means that somehow it's not just co-creation because it's a good idea you bring somebody in, but it is about learning some new things. How do you do that? Um, Arjun, do you want to start first and I'll have Anne, you no, go. I, I would love to actually hear Anne and, and then uh, add some thoughts because there's, okay. I think, of there. Uh, and yeah, I, 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 I'm happy to come in, but- uh, Okay, I'll, let's I'll, have Anne go first. So, so before I answer that question specifically, I wanna say, um, on the one hand, is this is an extremely exciting time of reinvention for, for museums. Uh, and it's full of opportunity. <laughs> and I also wanna say, we're all gonna fail to some degree because the speed and the amount of change that we're being asked to do while we still have to do our core missions and we're nonprofit institutions, which means we just don't have ample resources, makes the challenge really hard. So Arjun, I really am a big believer, for example, for bringing the past in conversation with the present. What can we learn from the past? What can we learn from the present? But now you're also encouraging us to be um, uh, fortune tellers. And I'm like, my mind is ready to, to like just e explode. So let's just put that on hold for a little bit. So, yeah. um, but, I, but I do want to say that um, expertise still matters. You know, you can't have a curator of African art who hasn't studied all, I think it's 56 countries on the African continent, <laughs> the various, uh, you know, traditions, rituals, languages, et cetera, and, and be able to effectively talk about these objects and their how they were used, their purpose, who made them, um, et cetera. So expertise still matters, but it also matters to have diverse um, expertise help us see what we're not seeing. Uh, our previous Egyptologist, Ed Blyberg, was working on a project um, about iconoclasm with our collection at the Pulitzer. And the Pulitzer has a practice of bringing in community members from religious leaders to community leaders uh, to help <coughs> give feedback to a curator, a scholar, about what they're presenting. And it was not something that uh, Ed had experienced before, and it was mind-blowing for him. 
And, you know, we've been talking about having that kind of input in our curatorial practice here. And until he had experienced it, he didn't understand how his, his perspectives could be expanded and how that improved the storytelling he was able to create for that exhibition. So I think that it's not, uh, when, when we think about community input, people don't really understand what that right. means, but it's about bringing diverse expertise to the table to help expand the narratives, to help expand how we tell the stories. And uh, and then now today, of course, there are a whole lot of ways that we're expected to do that. We do it in the exhibition. We invite participation and conversation um, in the exhibition. How are we doing that? Uh, is it effective? And then also there's just digital technology. And you know, I was on a talk with McKinsey, I think a week ago, and they shared a statistic that 10 years of digital in, uh, innovation happened in a span of less than one year. Right. Right. So the speed of change for all industries is great, and it's certainly true for our field. And I also think that actually you're in the field where I've often said, and I think that I want to get towards you as well, is that I've often felt that the speed of change in certain fields is very, very fast cultural values and attitudes don't change always as fast. So there has to be a layering of what changes fast, how do you respond, and recognize that there are certain things that are deeply held that don't really change. So there is something about expertise, the speed of change, and things that don't change. And the museums, at, I mean, I think the core of this is that Museums used to be seen as the temple on the hill. They were beyond society, beyond the social change. Now what we are saying is, forget that model. Museums are part and parcel of the social fabric of the society. And therefore, going back to what Matthew, you were saying, that museum creates audiences in interaction with objects because it isn't just a place where the audience is going no matter what. There is something about that parity of interaction. It used to be that our mission statements all said, museums are about preserving, blah, 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 and then for the benefit of the audience. What you're saying is the interactivity that matters most. And how do and we do that? And by the way, change, change is going to continue to happen. The world right. has changed. So not only are our eyes open, it's not like this moment is gonna pass and directors who don't wanna be brought into the 21st century and curators are gonna duck and hide. It's not possible. We have something called social media. Right. We're gonna be held to a very high standard whether we agree with it all the time or not, constantly in very public ways. Right. So change, I, have to, I think, is here to stay. So the presence of social media makes a huge difference in the accountability, sharing of information and transparency and misinformation. Let's put it out there. So Arjun, one mm. word, not one well, word, uh, last concept. Again, there's a, a lot here on uh, the table. I'm very grateful for Anne's uh, last round of comments. And I want to come to the question of expertise uh, in a moment in which I'm a deep believer because I'm, you know, Basically, my entire CV is based on knowing something about things most of humanity is not interested in, and somehow leveraging that into a stable academic career. So I'm, I'm all for it, um, and a big believer, whether it's area studies or 19th century visual studies or whatever, I'm a huge believer in those things. Uh, but here's the thing I want to say, I wrote uh, a very short, intervention for a journal called Art Margins, which asked me about something or the other. And basically I said, you know, in a kind of slightly extreme way, which one does when one has, you know, 800 words, that the aura of the art object in, in, the, in the Benjaminian sense has actually completely left art proper. It's in finance. It's in the world of derivatives, trading. That's where aura has gone because it's the place where uncertainty, risk taking, this that has massively sucked away. So this is not about museums becoming spaces of commodification, art collections, world markets. It's about something else. It's that 
altogether, the aura has moved to another space. <laughs> Let's call it global finance. But that's a personal little view, but I do think there are some big crises that we uh, face. But the thing I wanted to say more concretely is uh, we do need uh, expertise, but we need expertise, I think, concretely uh, from the very people who are experts. Let, let me preface, sorry. I take one step back. I'm very attentive and appreciative of Matthew's comments about audience, Anne's comments also about related issues, about the ecology, so also communities. But I think we have to keep asking in the old Aristotelian way, you know, we have a subject and we have a predicate. We ask lots of questions about predicate and try to keep the subject undisturbed. The subject has two parts. One is the it, the museum. <laughs> it is this, it is that, it can do this, it should do that. But the it is, is fairly inert for most of us for very good reasons. It's hard to disturb that it. And the other is it's hard to disturb the I, I the curator, I the director. So. We, we like to hold the eight of the eye and then see the predicates as highly mobile, volatile, there's race, there's wokeness, there's money, there's, you know, but we have to recognize that the eight and the eye have to be put into play as things whose primary qualities, such as preservation versus something else, such as a oratic or religious experience versus something else, have to be put into play. So we have to be able to question both the it and the I of curators, directors, right. experts, et cetera. So and it's, I it's yeah, so I mean, I think what you, a, go ahead. Additional point to say, if that's the case, then I think we can very much keep our experts as highly valued colleagues, curators, et cetera, but invite them, stimulate them, nudge them, into slightly redirecting their expertise. If somebody's working on Benin art, that to proto Benin art, great. But I'd love to know which of those Benin pieces were actually pregnant with some possibility for the future. Some were, and the truth is some are not. Some just tell the Benin story again. Let me be blunt about it. And that's true of all art, from the Renaissance to whoever. So can we ask our experts? to make a distinction by which we could all be enriched. And that's what I mean by symptoms of the future, not some uh, you know, helicopter theory about the future, but really in the archives the and in the objects, are there things that point differently than other equally stunning things, but only they know. <laughs> I can't say. So anyway, I stopped there. No, but I think that if you mentioned the Benin objects, I thought we were going to go somewhere else, which is that what stories do we tell, including the story of what happened to these pieces, the way they were looted, burning of the palace, all of these are contextual. So then there is this question of the context of the work, how much that comes in, for whom and where, and when does it go away? When does it get repatriated? And that in itself becomes a big question for the museums of partial histories, as I call our encyclopedic museums, because they're all accidents of history. What came to you, depending on who collected where, when. So let's get away from the encyclopedic museum, universal museums, they're museums of partial histories, but they do give you sense of objects from elsewhere. If and I may just much. add a comment, Bisaka, to that. Yeah. I'm a total believer that there's been very little attention. I'm here in Berlin where we have a museum on every block. It's like a church or a bar or something. Uh, but provenience, so-called, is not still a big thing that you can get as an audience member walking. You don't know where the damn thing came from, why, who collected it, etc. That's still an aspiration. And I think it's a it's a great one, but I'm only adding one more thing. And one more dimension. Yeah. We can do it all together. We can say, look, there are histories here. And then when we examine these histories, we see that objects can be read right. as sometimes really just excellent records of a way of life, a cosmology. Right. That's, I'm not now, against that. 
Yeah. Can I get it? It to be something else? Anyway, Matthew is is yeah. is uh, stimulated to leap in, please. No, no, no I was in, we were in that. Okay, so only to say I love your phrase, museums of partial histories. Um, I fundamentally don't believe museums, however, are accidental. I think they're very intentional and they have a purpose. And our collecting histories are very specific. And I could describe Boston's and Anne could describe exactly. Anne and right. all the rest. Um, I'm troubled uh, by the way we're talking about expertise. Um, and I'll share an anecdote from my first week as a museum director in Boston, uh, uh, very uh, boldly uh, sharing something which I believed and having an unexpected response. Uh, and that is that I believe that what we don't know is more interesting than what we do know. And I said that to the curators because I wanted to create an environment of curiosity and engagement. By the way, I still believe that. And I had very strong pushback. And a curator said to me, the best you can say is what we don't know is as interesting as what we know. And I, I didn't want to get into the negotiation, but what I'd say to my fellow panelists is the following. Is there a way to talk about expertise differently than we do? Because I think that expertise focuses too much on the notion of uh, prescribed and assumed knowledge with a little bit of expansion as we do more research within a defined field. And expertise doesn't seem to engage with issues like curiosity, like judgment, like uh, ethical values. You know, it, it stays in the realm of uh, negotiated consensual facts. And right. I, I just put out there that that might be some work to do because we can't win the argument uh, when we go up against curators. And I, and I don't necessarily want to win that argument by taking away their expertise. But you know, I want to actually give you a very specific example of exactly what you're talking about. And this is when I was at the MFA as a curator in charge of Indian Southeast Asian and Islamic collection. At that point, Kathy Halbreich, who had just come in as a contemporary curator, one of the first ones, and she had invited Martin Purrier to be the artist in residence to look at collection and based on his interest and create a new uh, installation that Martin would do. Martin said to him, I want to look at a miniature that's a Mughal miniature in the Indian collection, 17th century, of an owl, of a big, it's, it's a very famous painting, early 17th century. And he came with Kathy. First, we looked at 19th century pictures that they wanted to look at, and they, they were really interested in that. And I said, you know what? They're not really that good. And so we got into the question of why is it not good? What's going on? What interested Martin? Then when Martin looked at this falcon picture, because he was into falconry at the time, and he started looking at this miniature, and he talked about the way the claws were and the idea that falcon was a hunting, but a captive animal, captive bird, a captive bird that was used to hunt others. And he started talking about what that meant about captivity, the claws that were holding on. It made me see that world. And I knew this picture, 17th century Mansur, amazing painter. I knew everything there was to know about it. And he made me see it in a different way. And for me, I've never seen that picture again the same way. And so what happened was that I realized that as a curator, you have to always be a student, a learning person, where new things, new ways of asking questions, it's the new way of asking questions that actually make you think about the object in a different way. And that made me think also of something, that's why Arjun, I've so loved your social life of things, because objects go through many, many different trajectories, mm -hmm. and they open up new ways of asking questions. If you don't, you're not open, you're not going to get there. So perhaps it's not so much the expertise, but it's about the willingness to relearn, rethink, question, and bring that in. And so when I wrote the label for that Falcon picture for the final installation, it was completely different from what I would have written before. And that 
was just, I, I think about this. So when I saw Martin again 25 years later, I still remember that profoundly because it changed how I saw things. And it goes back to Basquiat and your exhibition, Matthew, that when I looked at that exhibition and there were perspectives that came from the community, they were all very distinguished people. Their labels were as interesting as was the label that came from the curator. And that mm -hmm. made me change how I thought of Basquiat. So that's one of the things that I think we have to think about. And I want to get back to the objectness of objects in museums, especially at the Museum of Partial Histories. And I want to just briefly touch on, because we're running out of time, but I want to briefly touch on the repatriation issues. Right now, in the field that I come from, Indian and Southeast Asian art, and what's happened with Southeast Asian objects in the Metropolitan Museum, there's huge conversation about repatriation of objects. And I want to think about that with you. And I'm going to start actually with you, Anne. But also, I want to get to Kamini, because there is this issue of possession of objects. Who does the art belong to? And the history that is embodied in this issues of repatriation that comes back to equity at the transnational level, not at the domestic level. How do we think about and how can we think about objects that now are contested? And as somebody said that, you know, if you think about museums as a place for contested values and contested ideas, as Homi has said, or as Kathy sometimes used to say that museums should be a safe place to discuss unsafe ideas and unsafe questions. Also, that creates all kinds of problems for all contestation because museums are also seen as places for reflection, for imagination, for all those other things that are embedded in the, in the question. So the question of repatriation that at the transnational level is very big. Um, and Anne and Matthew, you might have some thoughts on that, and then I really want to hear from Kamini. Matthew, you want to go first? Um, I'm happy to say something, but do you want to go first? Look at that. Yeah. So I'll, 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 say, I'll say, you know, listen, the issue of what museums uh, hold in trust and what they continue to collect, those are two connected right. issues. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I think that there are legal and moral and ethical uh, concerns, which I think are truly going to uh, become more and more apparent to all of us. And I think the the, the international language around those clarify. I really do believe that. I think what 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 um, what we also have to think about is the strategic issue. And I would just say simply, I think we are going to move into a period, notwithstanding uh, how vibrant Art Basel Miami apparently was and the frenzy in the art market at auctions this fall. I think we are going to move uh, to a, I don't know if I'm going to call it a generation or a moment in which the whole notion of ownership is going to be subsumed by a more um, rigorous conversation about display. And I think that if we can get our heads around the connection between the two then, and separate the notion of ownership from the notion of display or narrative, we might actually get to more cooperative models uh, that are a way forward. And I, I do think that, as I say, legal, moral, uh, ethical issues, I think will sort themselves out. I think we're getting much closer to the notion of what the right thing is. Uh, I think then we're going to have to move uh, very purposely into deeper strategic thinking to think about what, what and how these collections can be shared and what meaning they have in different places. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I agree with what Matthew has said, and I think it gets more complicated when we take a look at um, how art is being sold um, online. Think about the NFTs, right? People are making art that are specifically meant to be NFTs, but also uh, art collectors, and I'm sure institutions that own work, that have the copyright to the work, are now uh, making digital um, 
uh, uh, creations that were not part of the artist's original intent. So all of this about how we share what we own is becoming explosively more complicated in this digital age. Right. So there is the contemporary thing and then there is the past thing. And all of them have ethical and legal questions that need to be really sorted through. And that's why I think one can't hide behind the idea that we are the Universal Museum. It is for all to see and it's OK. At the same time, there are questions around art do have capacity to connect cultures. Art do have capacity to connect communities. and people travel. So then lots of different groups of people who are from different parts of the world, they want to see stuff of their own. So there's a whole lot of questions and Kamini, you and I were talking about that, that the issue of repatriation that has become so big, and especially in India, there's some people who are fighting tooth and nail. This is also happening in other places. How do you look at this question of source country, if you will? Uh, in this case, India, works have been elsewhere. Should all the things go back to India? What would that be? Well, <laughs> no, nothing so dramatic, but I think <laughs> objects cannot be viewed in terms of their aesthetic value alone. Context is hugely important as well. Who was made by and why? What is the meaning and the value it had for the community it came from? So once an object is removed from its context, it can still in a beautiful, interesting, or unusual, unusual object, but it becomes hugely challenging to convey its significance. And there's a very interesting story I would like to tell you about a sculpture of Shiva at the CSMBS in Mumbai. So it was worshipped at a temple in a city until historians discovered this was actually a 10th century sculpture. And after a lot of backing and forthing, the temple authorities finally decided that it would be handed over to the museum in their city, but they said, that the Lord Shiva would still have to be worshipped. And so every Monday when the museum is closed, a puja is performed by the staff to fulfill the promise and communicate the understanding this, that this was not just a stone carving, but this meant something to the people it came from. So for me, Vishaka, I think the way forward is for all of us to learn, just learn how to share. We don't have to own everything. Museums across the world have thousands of objects that lie in storage and will never see the light of day. So let's just loan objects, long-term loans, temporary loans, whatever. So the idea is to allow audiences to experience and enjoy different cultures, and more important, to allow communities to access, access to their heritage, because that is crucial to the understanding of their identity and their culture. So it's just about accessibility and sharing, I think. More than you know, I often used to say when people told me about the why Universal Museums, there should be all the things that people should see everywhere. And I used to say, well, why is it that it's only in the global north? Why can't we have some possibility for people in India to see Egyptian art, Impressionist art? They don't have that access. So there is something about equity and access that have to come together. And therefore, what are the new models that we can develop? do share the idea of the possibility of arts that can connect cultures, that can imagine, that can do other things other than possession. So I think that, Matthew, you're right, that there is something about objects in institutions that are less about possession and more about sharing. And therefore, what does that mean? I want to, uh, we are going to run out of time. So I want, there is one question that sort of, uh, comes up and one is the institutional change. We've talked about objects, we've talked about audiences. I do want to just address the issue of institutional change. That at this moment, as is true everywhere, there is issues of governance of institutions at the board level, also about staffing, equity questions, which are all the social things that are swirling all around us and they're coming into the museum setting. So I know that as museum leaders and you and Matthew have dealt with that, Kamini, you have other sets of questions about what does it really mean in terms of governance of institution? And I want to just briefly ask you as to, is this crisis actually turning us into thinking differently 
about leadership and governance of institutions. Um, Matthew? I don't know the answer to that question. I certainly think that um, uh, it has given us a greater clarity around the question of um, how we have reciprocal conversation. Um, and that reciprocal conversation is both in the development of content and around certain issues of governance. Um, you know, without going into detail, and I certainly wouldn't want to call Anne out on this, but Anne and I are both going through unionization processes at the moment, which are an extension of an activism that is prevalent, union or not. And uh, there are a number of issues. Uh, how is my voice represented? How is decision dispersed throughout the institution? How do I get the uh, my voice heard around questions of priority? Um, I, I believe that that pressure, which is coming from below more urgently than before, uh, will end up pushing our governance structures to look a little bit different. Uh, but I want to caution around how much difference, because until the funding models right. of our institutions change, um, there is going to be uh, a lot of negotiation and settling of what that balance looks like. But I do think there is something in the air or in the water uh, that didn't exist before. No, I mean, um, Anne? I, I'm not even sure how to answer the question because I'm not really, you know, the, the question is so big on governance. Are we yeah. talking about, uh, you know, the individuals who sit on our boards? Are we talking about the, you know, what, what you know, expertise leadership has? Are we talking about bylaws? So it's too big of a question for me to provide mm -hmm. a meaningful response. What I would say is that I think um, we, we need to the field needs to lead a little bit more. There's a lot of misinformation, really gross damaging misinformation about how museums are run. Uh, and we're just constantly, you know, like a punching bag. Um, and I think that as a field, we really need to take a look and express more clearly how we're run. What is the role of a board? I mean, my own staff thought that board members were paid like a corporate board. They didn't realize they were actually not making programmatic decisions. They didn't making, know that? No, they thought, yeah, they didn't know that. I, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and we see it all the time in the art press and, and, and universities, et cetera. Uh, so there's some education that needs to be done. But I do agree with Matthew that um, uh, governance is going to shift, it is shifting. And I think a lot of that is quite healthy. Yeah, I mean, I think why I asked this question is that I do think that in a broader context, it is something in the air in the society. It is happening in many, many other institutions to really look at what does shared responsibility mean? What does transparency mean? How does things get governed? Who do you account for and where do you go? I think that in America, it becomes particular. I've, I've talked to so many colleagues in the academic world where, and some people have actually said that essentially, if you can't change the funding model, it should come from the state. And I said, well, that's not possible in America. It doesn't work like that. And then the next question is that, well, if you can't deal with the social justice question, maybe you shouldn't exist. That's one question. And I always say, but then what about millions of people who do go to museums, who do want to see the art, who do want to think about art in a much more kind of cerebral, but also emotional way. So the, the question is not an either or, but it's a question of how do you create a shared new way of looking at this? So one question that comes up is that, you know, do we really remind people that actually these objects, especially for the so-called encyclopedic museums, that they have come from huge amount of colonial practices that have to be dismantled? And I always say, it isn't so simple because objects have also traveled and have been sold and bought all for millennia. A trade and objects has been part of, if you go to Xi'an today, Xi'an in China in the eighth century was the global capital. Things were coming from everywhere. People were bringing it as objects. People were bringing it as gifts. People were 
coming really as vassal states. They were required to pay something and give something. So we have to pay attention to the specificity and not be ideologically only one way or the other. So that brings me to the very last question, and that is, you have said, Matthew, that it's going to be incremental change. You have said, uh, Kamini, that you know you still have to come back to the wrestling with the physicality of the place and what would change. I think I would like all four of you to just imagine 10 years from now. And now I say, as a woman of a certain age, Arjun and I are from one generation, all of you are much younger than us. And we did go through the late 60s and early 70s. A lot of the questions that are coming up right now, whether it was Harlem on my mind at the Met, whether it was the unionization, I remember walking in front of the Met and the modern, even though Brooklyn already had some union at the point. So lots and the questions of repatriation were coming up at UNESCO in a bigger way at the time in the 70s. So is this a true inflection point where there is no going back? Or is it yet another moment in history where inflection points then turn into settling into some smaller changes, but not a huge amount of changes? So 10 years from now, if you're having this conversation, where do you think the changes would have come from? And or is this or not going to be very, very clear. So Arjun, I want to start with you first. Well, this is, of course, a, <clears throat> a giant question, but I'm uh, still tempted to say one word on the governance question, the previous one, to say that as an inhabitant of the university world, which is connected to, but not the same as the museum world, the single biggest unexamined question of my 50 years in the US Academy is who do board's answer to. My hypothesis is God, but since most of us don't believe in God, then the question is who do they answer to? And they are wreaking havoc with many institutions and the university world, I can say this with authority. They are wrecking the American university as a form. With the museums, I leave it to my friends who run museums to say, but I can certainly say, we need to ask hard questions about who are these trustees? What is their expertise? And it's related to funding, of course, uh, wherever. I've never seen a privileged cultural institution that doesn't have 10 extremely well-off people behind it, whether they're trustees or not. That little embarrassment has to be confronted, but that's the previous question. Let me just go to this one. Uh, the kind of what's changed, what's new. I think uh, I struggle with this all the time in respect to globalization, where people point out, of course, that the world was global 200,000 years ago because human bipedals went from one place to another. So I've dealt with a thousand versions of this, we have been there before argument. The point is things change and sometimes changes are very significant. And we have to live with that observation, though because the owl of Minerva is not yet decisively flown, we have to guess that we are in the middle of a significant change. And I think all of us are doing that in one or other way. My view is, yes, there's a long history to the thing I'm gonna to point to, but I think it is the knob of our problem now for museums and perhaps even beyond museums. That is that the torque or distance between um, aspirations to participation, to citizenship, whether from Dalits in India, Blacks in the US, whoever, the distance between their sense of outrage and their aspiration to participation and the views of those who hold the keys to these kingdoms, trustees, boards, funders, donors, is exceedingly large. The torque has increased and either there's going to be some clever accommodation or the thing is just going to fly to pieces like any engine in which the torque is excessive. So I do think we're dealing with a situation which we have seen before, classes, elites, blah, blah, blah. But we've never seen a situation where such a large part of mankind is disenfranchised, but also aware of what's possible for them. That I believe is new. And we're all tackling that, universities, et cetera. But 
also museum. So that's to me the new thing, what, however we decide to address it. And I suspect- The torque, that, as you described, the torque, the tension the is uh, much which more- is not just the, the ins and the outs. It's the fact of what the ins know and want, <laughs> which right. no longer will tolerate simple dismissal, ignorance, complacence, uh, just doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Right. And, and that's the inflection point. Yeah. That to me is, yeah. yeah. Inflection. And, and who would like to go next? Where do you think this is going to be transformative? No going back or little at a time. And then you might settle into some other normalcy. Kamini. Yep. Well, I think change is inevitable. And, and I think it's necessary for us to stay relevant because an audience always needs to understand why the objects in a museum are relevant to their lives. So like everything in life, museums need to evolve to meet the demands of this changing world, whether that's been brought about by technology or the pandemic or whatever. But I think that that needs to come from within the system because if we look around us in the world where everything has transformed so rapidly, museums have been the slowest to change. So um, I, I would like to see them less as these intimidating temples to brand collections and instead to be the space bubbling with ideas and conversations that are initiated from the collection. But then we have to take that forward. I think the pandemic has shaken us up a fair bit, but I still think there's much to be done and it's, it's time to energize ourselves and just move forward. There you go. Anne? I don't think museums are the slowest to change. I look at the private space in the art world and I'm like, we're way ahead. And I think museums are getting um, uh, all the, all the you know, finger pointing and, uh, and uh, we're not looking more robustly at our field, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, I'm not sure Vishaka how to answer the question because on the one hand, I see a lot of positive change. You know, there are more women, more people of color who are entering into leadership positions within our field that will contribute to new ideas, new energy, and new practices that are uh, extraordinarily important. So that's very exciting. And I think the digital presents opportunities for us to connect beyond, you know, our, our you know, physical audiences. And, um, you know, I'm very excited about this, you know, this, this metaverse in, in some ways, right? So, so I think that there's a lot of uh, excitement that will permanently really change how museums do their work for the better. And at the same time, I think the social forces um, around us are so huge. You know, are we looking, for example, for those of us who are in the United States at the end of, end of American democracy as we know it? Probably, very possibly. Can we as a field do anything about that? Those forces are ha ha hitting us so hard, so fast. I'd like to think that culture is the answer. I think it is a part of the answer, but I don't know how much our museums can do, um, how, how quickly we can move compared to artists or others. Um, so I, I don't know, the forces against us are huge and, um, and troubling. Yeah, Matthew? Um, listen, I don't know what, how you're doing on your time, and I know that there might be some questions. I would just simply say that a trustee gave me a magic wand when I became a director, and it hasn't worked. And uh, no one's given me a, um, a crystal ball yet, but I can assure you that if, if they did, it wouldn't work either. I would just say that conversations like this are part of the answer. Yeah. I mean, I think that the reason why I asked that question is that I there's a wonderful phrase in Gujarati, that says, uh, Nishan Chukmaf Nain Man Nishu Nichu Niman, meaning it's okay to aim high and fail, but it is not acceptable not to aim high. And so, one of the reasons why I ask that question is that sometimes it's a small block that will get you somewhere. But what, what you're saying, Anne, is that there is something in the air, and what Arjun, you've very articulated very well, is there is a torque, and that's about equity question on the one hand, at the local level and the transnational level. There is a torque that is about 
asking for greater democratization of the institutions that have hid behind the veil of expertise. But then there is also the veil of money. And that opening is going to continue to happen. Exactly how it will take place, where it will go, I think it will be in the small steps that we will have to look for that. This huge amount of really very, very good, thoughtful questions that have come in. One suggestion that has come in is some idea of global certificates that would be about the ethical institutional behavior. And um, sort of these are preconditioned for donors and what that would be. That could be one of the questions that would come in. The question is the funding model that we have currently in America really makes it almost difficult to figure out exactly where we go. But I should say at the university level, there are, at least I know at Columbia, there is a panel that looks at any major funding and examines actually this money is something that has the ethical dimension or not, and not take the money if it looks like it is not going to fit that. So we may want to do something more with that. That would be a useful question to look at. But what I can say is it's 1222. I know we have to go further. I think there's huge amount of really wonderful uh, observations and questions that have come in in the chat section uh, from very different parts of the world. So one is that this digital and the real and what it does because the digitizing collection is a part of creating an online space. But then there is also the question of what is that experience of the real? And I remember some time ago, and you and Matthew, you will understand and appreciate, and that was at AMD when I had the honor of being a president one time. Um, and I have to say two things. One is that there were more of our colleagues who confused me with Kinshasa Conwell because we were the only two directors of color and people confused us. Hopefully that is changing rapidly and for the good reason. I think the younger people, as you said, Anne, really are my hope because the younger curators were asking very different questions from the people who were there before. So there is, there is a, a sliver of hope. And at the same time, the challenges are real as we go forward. And this trifecta of the issues that we discussed earlier, I hope out of that something new will emerge, but it may not be evident to us exactly where it's going to be. So thank you all very, very much for this really good conversation that has lots of little nuggets. And I hope this is really part of a continuing process for our project on politics of visual arts. So stay tuned as we go forward. And thank the audience. Uh, you have been terrific, especially as you've written all of these comments. It's been difficult to get all of that in, but I do hope that you have all enjoyed this conversation. Please join me in thanking our panelists. We can't see you, but I hope that you have enjoyed uh, this particular conversation. Thank you very, very much, everybody. And to be continued, stay tuned. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. And thank you to the CGT team. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.